So the Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology notes that diabetes is a group of health conditions that cause high blood sugar levels. If left untreated, high blood sugar can harm the body and damage organs over time. There are many types of diabetes, but three main types are the most common, from type 1 to type 2 and even gestational diabetes. So we'll talk about the latest research, treatment options and most importantly ways to manage and prevent this condition. Joining me now is Dr. Raina Dyer. She of course is the head of endocrine division at Helen Joseph Hospital, University of Advertisement and chairperson of Society of Metabolism, Endocrinology and Diabetes South Africa. It's a pleasure to have you here in studio with us. Thanks for coming in. Thank you Leanne. And, um uh, thanks for the invitation and welcome, uh, I'm sorry, uh, morning to all the viewers. Yeah, indeed, it's good to have you here because this is probably one of the most important conversations and one where if we, I suppose, had to look at statistics, um, the amount of people that are diagnosed and, and, and have diabetes in this country, the figures must be exceptionally high, I imagine. So yes, yeah, so we have a, it's actually a pandemic, yeah. um, epidemic. We have worldwide numbers that are exceedingly high and we've postulated in the next 10 to 20 years, the numbers are gonna increase by a whopping 143% by the year 2045. So this means we're gonna be seeing two to three times the amount of patients that we're seeing currently. Wow. Now we already have an overburdened uh, healthcare uh, practice, both in the private and in the public sector. So I'm not sure how we'll be able to manage with these extra numbers numbers and do a good job at that. So let's let's perhaps do some education because that's perhaps where we can start preventing people from getting diabetes. Uh, firstly basics 101 what is diabetes? So diabetes is a chronic condition where one is not able to regulate their blood glucose levels. So in a normal individual the pancreas releases insulin and this allows us to then uh, uptake our glucose and utilize it. If someone has diabetes, the pancreas is either not able to make any insulin or in the case of type 2 diabetes, not able to utilize it. So either way, you'll have high glucose levels and this then leads to long-term complications on multiple organs in the body. Yeah, all right. So, I mean, uh, uh, two, two issues that I want to get quickly addressed. Is it, is it um, um, what, uh, do you inherit it? Is it something that comes if your father or your mother's got it, are you highly susceptible to it? So if you have a family history, it, is, it does confer a higher risk for you, but okay. there are multiple risk factors. So there's actually four types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition, mm -hmm. and this is where you're not, your body is not making any insulin at all, in which case we as doctors then supplement you and treat you with insulin. Mm. That's where we, you inject yourself yes. in the morning or whenever Multiple it is. Multiple times a day. Multiple times yeah. a day. Then we've got type 2 diabetes, which is the most commonest one, and this is where we have insulin, but you're not, your body is not able to utilize it and thereby not able to use the glucose. So this leads to long-term high glucose levels, leading to the complications. Now, for this, for this type 2 diabetes, there are multiple risk factors, um, some that we can do something about and others that we can't. So the risk factors are if you've got uh, age above 45, if you've had gestational diabetes, it confers a high risk. If you've got family members who's got diabetes, and the more family members that you have that have diabetes, your risk increases. Sure. If you come from a high ethnic background, for example, being Indian, or if you've got an underlying medical condition like HIV, this then predisposes you. And then the lifestyle factors are the ones that we can do something about to alter someone's risk. Okay, I'm gonna pause you on the lifestyle factors and I wanna go back yeah. to what you mentioned about um, being Indian. Yes. Is this, a, is this a, a high risk category? Do you find that amongst the majority of the population that Indians are of higher risk. Indians are of higher risk, as well as the traditional Africana uh, patients really? also at higher risk. Yeah. What, do, do we know why? It's a genetic, um, okay. yeah. a, a genetic, genetic disposition. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. So, I mean, the advice that you give is obviously to be tested 
Yes. Very, very much so to ensure, you know, whether or not. Can, can you ever tell if you're going to be predisposed to it or is that something that you need to be on top of and every single year go for your so screening? So if you have these risk factors, then you should be keeping an eye not only on your lifestyle but on your glucose levels. And if your glucose levels remain normal, you'll then still have to keep an eye because your risk will never fall away. Okay. So let's talk about the lifestyle issues because I think that this is possibly, and this is from a very uneducated point of view, but I imagine that the lifestyles we lead, the food we eat, the lack of exercise, everything that is unhealthy, whether it be the drinking, the smoking, all of these kind of things are what's leading to you talking about this, this, this massive, uh, not a pandemic, but whatever it is that is, is gripping the world. So what is it that's the biggest problem with lifestyle? So with lifestyle, um, we have poor diet, so eating too many refined carbohydrates, fatty foods, too, sh too many sugary drinks, etc. Mm. Leading a sedentary lifestyle, so for example, you know, being a couch potato, not exercising, not leading active lives, all of this then makes your body incapable of utilizing the glucose and thereby unable to regulate your glucose levels, leading to high uh, glucose levels for a long time and that leads to the complications. Yeah. Before we go on though, I said they were type 2 and I didn't mention the type 3, so just the, the, yeah, uh, re the viewers. So type 3 is related to a whole host of other conditions that may predispose you to diabetes and type 4 we've mentioned is gestational diabetes. Yes. So if someone's diagnosed with di diabetes in their pregnancy, um, after pregnancy, they actually have a 50% chance of developing diabetes long term. Wow. So it, it, do you find that pregnant women, this is something that, that happens quite often? So if they, if they meet risk factors, they need to be screened. Okay. Unfortunately, there is no universal screening. Mm. But if you have risk factors, they sh need to be tested because this then not only relates to them, the high glucose levels, but we have to worry about the baby as well. Mm. And once they're on treatment for the diabetes during their pregnancy, they need to be tested thereafter, yeah. after the pregnancy, which we feel we've seen that this is where the biggest shortfall is. After the baby's out, patients think that everything is back to normal and it isn't. So that's where the gap is. Patients need to recheck after the pregnancy. One of the things I suppose that's an important thing is once you have diabetes, whether it be one, two, three or four, can you ever get rid of it or is that something that you have for life? So type 1 diabetes, no, because your pancreas is not working, you don't have any insulin and we supplement. Okay. Type 2 diabetes is the one where lifestyle measures can really make a huge difference. It may not fully put you into remission, but if you do all of these lifestyle measures, it can surely go a long way in reducing the amount of medication or treatment you'd require to keep your glucose levels normal. But if you acquire up to 15% of weight loss, this does set you up to go into a potential remission, but then this has to be maintained by your lifestyle. Yeah, so, so there is, I mean, depending on what it is, you can help losing weight, yes. exercising, eating properly, but obviously depending on the type of diabetes yes. that you do have. Yes. So you can very much so uh, try and bring yourself in. One of the things is, is uh, the biggest symptoms of diabetes are these silent killers, these things that you don't necessarily even know that you have. I mean, is there a symptom I should look out for? I mean, if I don't go for screening regularly, is there a symptom that will tell me, hang on, you're probably diabetic? So that's a difficult one. Yeah. If you put two diabetics in the room, both of them will present differently and their disease spectrum will be different. So patients can range from being completely asymptomatic to having non-specific symptoms. So for example, being very thirsty, waking up at night to go to the loo, um, to having some blurred vision. Now we've had a very hot weekend. People were feeling very thirsty and drinking mm -hmm. a lot of water and then perhaps waking up at night to go to the loo. So they may think that it was part of the weather and so this then hides behind and patients don't realize that they actually have diabetes. And it's very interesting that you bring this up because data has shown us that up to 50% of people with diabetes actually don't know that they have this I disease. Know walking around, going about their daily lifestyles and actually not knowing. And then we see this, they then present to hospital yeah. with the complication, a heart attack, a pneumonia, and the sugars are sky high. And by this time, it may be too late, they've already got complications. Yeah, you see, and that's, and that's a great worry. And that's why it's essential to go and keep on top of your, your vitals. How often do you recommend that people test that? I mean, what would be the, the, the easiest way to make sure that you, you're in good health? 
So all the diets and lifestyle measures oh, should be done. Yeah. yeah. And then if you have any of these risk factors, you should go and get yourself, have a finger prick check done yeah. and you can look at your glucose levels. Even if you don't have these risk factors, it may be a good thing to have it, have it done here and there so that you can stay on top of your glucose what, what levels. What is here and there though? So if you are at risk factors, it should be done annually. Okay. Annually. So yeah. it's good to do it annually. Yeah. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the one I'm looking for. So it's not something you need to do every six months no. or every three. So go annually and, and if it is raised, then, uh, then start investigating further yes. and get it under control. Because you can live a perfectly healthy life if you do treat it well, if you if, get it in time and treat it. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of advances in treatment. So there's no reason why patients, once diagnosed, can be put onto appropriate therapy and lead long, healthy lives. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite fascinated by hearing about some of these new technologies that may be, develop, uh, be in, being developed to detect it, early detection, um, and perhaps the, the tre tre treatment of it as well. So, you know, it's interesting, um, over a hundred years ago, if you were diagnosed with diabetes, it was actually a death sentence yeah. because there was no insulin available. So we've come a long, long way uh, from the older drugs and now newer insulins being developed. And in the last two decades, that was for type one. For type two, in the last two decades, we've seen a whole host of drugs being developed, oral and injectables, which means we now have a plethora of drugs really where we can individualize our patients. So that's the advances in the past. In terms of going forward, we've got apps that are being developed where you no longer have to be tested. It will look at your face and detect your glucose levels. Wow. In the future, they're looking to look, determine glucose levels from saliva. Um, and then in terms of monitoring devices, we've come a long way. Traditionally, patients prick themselves six to seven times a day. We've now got continuous glucose monitoring devices. They stick on their arm, which means patients don't have to prick themselves multiple times a day, yeah. which is distressing to them. Yeah. This will pick up and monitor your glucose levels 24 hours. In the, we've got recent advances with AI that will pick up changes at the back of the eye because diabetes leads to blindness. Yes, yes. Um, and going forward, there's a whole host of research that's being uh, done. Next year, we have smart pens being available, so patients and doctors can then determine how much of insulin is being uh, injected. So it's, we've come a long, long way with diabetes, and it's an interesting field where there's still a lot being done, and together with all of these advances, we can truly improve our patients' lives. Amazing, but the reality is, is that with all the drugs that are being developed and the treatment is, is there, people are still getting it because of these unhealthy lifestyles and that is a big problem. So we, we need to ensure that we educate people on healthy lifestyles, looking after yourselves and ensuring that you don't have to get diabetes um, if, uh, if you just keep it, uh, keep it clean. Let's put it that way. Doctor, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in. Very important conversation. Dr. Raina Dyer, Head of Endocrine Division at Helen Joseph Hospital, University of Witwatersrand and Chairperson of Society of Metabolism, Endocrinology and Diabetes South Africa.